Ladies and gentlemen, we have been on an incredible journey. Um, it began last summer. Um, I was taking a nap on that, and I realized, hey, wait a minute, I have this script and a DVD of the people that did it in Zurich who are actually union analysts. And I have it on my desk, and it's been there for a year. Maybe I should take a look at it. Maybe. And maybe we should perform it in uh, Helena. And so I looked at it, and I sent Henry Stein or Murray Stein an email, and I said, "Could we have permission to perform your play here today?" And. He, he's in Zurich, and Henry Abramovich is in Jerusalem. And both of them replied to me within five hours. Wow. And, uh, and with you know, glee that we would perform the play here. And um, so I placed an order with Chiron Publications and sent a copy of the script to Tim and all the players. And uh, we met in Optos uh, at Colleen's house in November, and we went through it, and I wept through the entire reading. I, you know, it's, a, it's a long story, but I, I just couldn't hold my feelings about it because they're very deep. and. John and Sherry uh, weren't deeply into it at that point. And we came up here to Helena and Tim challenged me and said, I don't think you can do this, Skip. He said, I think, I think, I don't want you to fail. And I said, Tim, I don't care if I fail. I just don't want you to fail. And because it's your hometown, and you're the professional director and actor. So uh, we went away from that and there was a big discussion back and forth up through uh, Thanksgiving time. And finally I said, well, okay, let's forget it. Uh, we can put something else in that block for the second our we, we said, no, <laughs> we're in. Forget it. <laughs> and uh, so I thought we were done. But then Tim came back to me and said, no, we got to do it. And we all went, oh, OK. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then we had to call John and Sherry and ask them if they were in or not. And they said that they were. Yeah. And in about February, we started rehearsing uh, once a week on Sundays with Tim. And you realize this is all on, on Zoom. Zoom. On Zoom, yeah. <laughs> because they live in California, Tim lives here, and I live in Annapolis, Maryland. And um, we were rehearsing every Sunday with Tim, and then John called me up and said, well, would you mind also rehearsing on Tuesdays and Thursdays? <laughs> but don't, don't tell Tim, <laughs> you want to keep it a secret. <laughs> So we'll rehearse Tuesdays and Thursdays ourselves, the three of us, and then we'll do it every once a week with Tim. So we did that for a couple of months, and then in about April we realized we pretty much were getting there. And so we cut it back to once a week, but we, were, we rehearsed um, every Tuesday up until last Tuesday. And, uh, and Tim was a brick. I mean, we, we got so much professional advice oh, yeah. from Tim Holmes. I'm yeah. incredibly grateful to you. Oh, thank you. And I'd like to add that uh, part of this process was witnessing that video that uh, Murray and Henry uh, put out. And I have to say, and I'm biased, but I have to say that I feel this production is 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 at least the equal, if not um, 
better. Yes, yes. And head and shoulders better than that. It really was. When we first watched the first video, it looked their own And Tim is explaining the, the uh, trajectory of a play. Like a play, you know, has some beginning, something exciting that happens, and then it kind of comes down. And he said, this play is like this. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. And, and the way it was acted before was like that. And we had to um, make it come alive. Yeah. <laughs> I'll mention a fact and then pass it on. Quite a few of the things that happened in that play actually happened. Yeah. And um, where, where the woman comes to Rabbi Beck and asks if she should go to Auschwitz, um, that woman became a Jungian analyst and was Henry Abramovich's training analyst in Jerusalem. Uh, when he was so she a didn't student. Take the train. She didn't get on the train. She didn't get on the train. Yeah. Intuition. What, what, what was her name? Uh, I forget her name. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you, do you? But Hen Henry told us that. And uh, so it's been extremely moving to us to work through all these facts. And so, John, you know more about. Leo Beck's. I, I read Beck's biography. Uh, we corrected the script in a couple of places. And we left, there were some other errors, but we left them in place because they were good for drama. Uh, but that, that scene with Eichmann really occurred. Yeah, I know that. And, and Beck, said, you know, he says, you're still alive? And he said, uh, well, you apparently are, you know, you're not dead yet. And he said, well, apparently you're referring to some future event. And he looked at, at Eichmann, who was blocking the door, and he just pushed him aside and walked out. And, and all through that biography, I came to understand how Beck was not intimidated. I mean, he knew the worst could happen at any moment, and he went through terrible things. But he stood up in the face of it. And the more I understood that about him, the more I tried to yeah. I have, uh, there's a rumor in the gulch that I delivered a few books, but I, I have several books uh, by and about Beck on the home front. Yeah. The interesting thing is that what they say about Beck is that I mean, he's one of the greats, like Heschel, like, like Boober. I'd never heard of him before this play, but I have now. Yeah. One of the things that we, uh, you know, trying to turn a play that goes like this into something that has some shape. Uh, one of the ideas is how these guys are uh, irritated by each other. Every time they're irritated, I thought about moving the chair farther away. And then when they finally listen, moving the chair again, just kind of symbolize the, the you know, the, the openness and the vulnerability and the defensiveness that we feel, and it turns out that that didn't work, but, um, but but it was really important to me to find the places where the where the action makes a transition. And I learned a lot of things about about this question that has been on my mind so much because we have this bifurcated society where the blue people don't talk to the red people and the red people can't understand the, under, the language of the blue people. And so how can it survive as a nation, you know, where e pluribus unum, we're supposed to be a unit, a unit of people, and yet we're just at loggerheads with each other, just like these two characters. And both of them have a good argument. And so how do you get to that place where we can talk to each other? And one of the things that we figured out in the, in the action of the play is Beck is, is very accusatory to begin with, and, and Jung is very defensive. But then finally, when they start talking to each other, they begin to, to soften. And each of them, in turn, opens up 
and says, well, guess what? I've got something I want to share with you. <laughs> and that's that beautiful moment where I'm, the person opens up and says, you know, here's, here's what I'm struggling with. Yeah. And I thought it was so beautiful when John Esbeck leans over the table. And that's a beautiful symbol of, of yes, I'm with you. And, and Jung says, I will listen to you. Yes, go ahead. You know, tell me your story. It's being receptive. And I love Sherry's question. Can there be reconciliation without forgiveness? Right. So many of these questions are stuff that we deal with. Are we going to be able to forgive Trump for what he did to the country? And can there be reconciliation, even though we can't, we can't forgive the guy on the other side? Can you reconcile somehow? Can you say, OK, I disagree with you totally, but I recognize the value of your humanity? Yeah, yeah. I People need to realize that they're not the feeling. They're not what? You are not your, you are not your beliefs. People I think, think you like their beliefs, and they don't understand that they're not their beliefs. You know, I think that's a big issue that we have. Yeah, that they're yeah. human beings. Uh, I think yeah. it's, it's not until they uh, each become uh, their own lives when they share their own lives with each other mm -hmm. that they begin to see each other. Uh, inside of the stigma that they have over them. Yes. And I think a, a point that um, that I like very much about the play, I, would, I think it could have been written in, in a stronger way, is when you say, how are we going to do this, uh, is that recognition of the gray zone. Mm -hmm. And when I think of myself sitting down with a, a red state person to talk about this, I, I wonder what can I move into a gray zone to do that? What would that be like for me to experience a gray zone for myself in order to be able to have a reconciliation? And that gray zone needs to be recognized, I think, uh, in order for us to move forward. Can you tell me what, can you define for me what a gray zone is to you? I, I think that the gray zone was that place, that's what I meant about being made more clear, that place where there's both right and wrong. Both are going on. There, there's no good answer here. We're both stuck in a bad place. And there's that's the gray zone. And we have to go to that place where we have to experience how fuzzy that may be. But the judgment that sits inside that gray zone is so painful. You have to, you have to go in there. You have to unclench the fist oh. yeah. first. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when Trump first came into office, I don't know how we're doing this, but I was, sorry, I'm sorry if I just stepped on somebody, but when Trump first came into office, well, one of the, one of the experiences I've made a part of my life for the last few years is is uh, Parker Palmer's, you know, active listening, and, and, and Parker Palmer's an old Quaker, and, and has written various books and, and such. And we have a wonderful person in town, now several people in town, who have facilitated groups of individuals to do active listening each with each other. Well, the book we had read shortly after Trump came into, t into power was uh, um, Healing the Heart of Democracy. Now that resonates with anybody here. But Parker talks about, you know, community, building communities and finding your communities. And it's made me much more aware of the communities, like, you know, Myrna Loy, is, 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 those of you from Helena, we are familiar with Myrna Loy. And it's a wonderful community. It's a place where you start looking and I, who knows who these people are, but we enjoy together. And I think, I guess, what I asked about the gray zone is because, because I think, you know, when I look, where do you begin? And we've, we've so much jumped in, to me, we've so much jumped into how do we get to agree on politics mm -hmm. and forgetting to say, 
God, I love that cane. That is the best cane. I've been looking for a cane for myself. <laughs> and that is so good. And finding out things about an individual, those things that build in a relationship. Do you like dogs or cats? What kind of house do you live in? Tell me about your history and so on and so forth. Which, you know, we just we just, you know, skipped over that and social media is part to fall. But we bought into it. We bought into it. Everyone here, even though for many different ages, we bought into it. And we look at people like, you know, like poster children. And, and not beneath the, the poster and say, tell me about you as a person. Tell me about that. Tell me, you know, whatever, whatever is appropriate at the time. Tell me what your child is sometimes appropriate. Usually it's not a, a good opening line. Um, but, you know, it's just saying, you know, like, just getting to know them as people and building from there. And I've been purposely bringing more people intentionally into my life who have different political views and doing that. And, and, and having wonderful times, and slowly, periodically, without alcohol, <laughs> at those times, then talking about, you know, kind of a high level of maybe delving down at some point in time, you know, into, into what the politics are. But, you know, we've kind of all we forgot about building relationships in not the gray zone and kind of the, the fun zone, you know, the part where you just say, God, I like spending time with you. Mm -hmm. Well, the gray zone is a very human place. It is very, hu it's both, very human. It's very human, but you don't get to human until you feel human. like you cannot be vulnerable in that human space. Yes. Yeah. So, I, I operate a YouTube channel called Carl Jung Dip Psychology Reading Group. I've been doing this since 2016. We now have about 1,300 videos on that channel. And uh, we have various groups there. And one time I was confronted uh, by someone who said, um, well, we gotta solve the patriarchy. They, we gotta make them change their attitudes, yeah, right? Sure. And they're wrong. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. Those men are the salt of the earth. And those men are the men that kept me alive in Vietnam. And we have to find a way to heal with those men. Mitch McConnell is the salt of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't serve in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but many, many people who've been misguided by our former president uh, did serve in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And they've been um, misguided by the habits of collective consciousness. I recognize that one. Yeah. <laughs> and if you go back through this play, which is going to be published on my YouTube channel, um, you'll find that there are many things, there are many profound things in the play itself. But the point is that we can't have intransigent positions. We have to recognize that there is something about the other person. And what our confluence is about this weekend is about using art as a medium through which we can find a common ground. Mm -hmm. not, I mean, that's what oh, we're yeah. Doing. And go ahead, Tim. Well, it seems to me that, that abortion is a really great example of something that is forever in the gray zone. There is no right answer. As my dad used to say, it's like getting a, a mouthful of hot coffee. Anything you do next is wrong. <laughs> and if we can just acknowledge that, that there is no right answer, you know, everything has both a light side and a dark side. So instead of saying, well, uh, like George Bush said, we have, you know, you're either for us or against us. It's a black and white world. There's evil on this side and good on this side. I think it's, as Jung helps us understand, there is a light side and a dark side in everybody. And so if we can approach each other by saying, you know, yes, I." absolutely disagree with you about abortion, but I recognize that you, the thing that you value is just as valuable as the thing that I value. And so, you know, can we 
live together as people who disagree, mm -hmm. like Beck and you. I want to tell you a story about my mother when she was dying. Um, we have a wonderful hospital in Annapolis, and everybody gets a single room. And they have hide beds so family can stay in the room with the patient. And for the last two weeks of her life, I was able to stay in the room with my mother. And we was almost the most beautiful moments that I had with my mother for 40 years, probably. But she told me two secrets. She had two secrets in her life. And she knew she was dying, and she wanted to tell me these two secrets so I would know. <laughs> One secret was that in 1960, she voted for JFK. <laughs> <laughs> and canceled out my father's vote. <laughs> and the other one was that my two grandmothers, who were Victorian women, they were both born in the 19th century, had five abortions between them wow. in the 1920s. They raised, they both raised three very successful children both of them, but they had to commit crimes and their doctors had to commit crimes mm -hmm. in order for them to have safe abortions and that's in the, the 1920s. Zone. That's, that's oh, the gray zone yeah. for the women and the gray zone for the doctors. Right. And it's coming back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so my daughters who are, were born at about the time of Roe v. Wade have lived in this golden time when, when abortion has been allowed, but they're about to find out, I'm afraid, how horrible it was before Roe v. Wade. I think most people in this room uh, probably remember uh, a couple of movies that are very moving on this. One is uh, In the Heat of the Night uh, with Sidney Poitier, and the other one is Dirty Dancing. And both of those movies were made before uh, abortion was permitted. And what we, what's happened now is that this issue is pushed through so that now we're going to have um, prohibited abortion once again. And it's going to be absolutely horrible. And I've tried to talk to my daughters about it, they won't hear it. So now they have to experience it. And I'm sorry about that, but you know, Carl Jung came a, a generation after Carl, uh, after Friedrich Nietzsche, who said that God is dead and we've killed him. That's what he said. And in the next generation, Carl Jung came along and he said, God is not dead. I know where he, he lives, and I know how he goes about doing the work of the Godhead. And we're about to see in bloody reality how he goes about doing the work of the Godhead with respect to that issue. With regard to the grace of God yeah. that we're talking about, I had a wonderful insight derived from a boss I worked for once and very simply said, he, he was an analysis, Jungian analysis at the time, and he's taken stock of himself. And he said, you know, Bob, when I feel that right about something, I know something's wrong. <laughs> and there's the shadow. Yeah. And I just, I keep going back to that. And I, I, you know, you feel that right about it? Well, take another look. <laughs> I just want to say, I think right now, we are in a time of reconciliation and in the gray zone. And to look at what it feels like right now, because 
two years ago, there were flags everywhere, there were trucks. I mean, it was horrible, and it's not right now. People can talk to each other and go down the street without all the hate signs and the flags, and there's no, anyway, so right now we're in that gray zone, and to me it's to remember maybe when another election comes up, like what does this feel like now? So that we can see when it starts ramping up again, and how do we get back to this place right now? My family can now meet and chat. Maybe two years ago that was hard. <laughs> and so we're in that gray zone right now, so to try to know what that feels like, and so when it starts pulling apart, we can recognize it and maybe try to put us back I together. The way we the video recording, what we're talking about tonight, and so if anyone who is speaking has reservations about being publicly on the video, please let me know before the end of this evening, because otherwise I'm going to publish it on my YouTube channel, and I have 70,000 followers everywhere in the world. So. Excuse me, Skip. I'd like to make sure that we hear from John and that we hear from Sherry tonight Absolutely. about what the experience has been like. Well, and I want to hear from Carson also. Okay. Did you want to say some more? Okay. Yeah, come on, Sherry. All right. So um, I think I was the one that wanted to get out of the play the most. And <laughs> I mean, quit it, you know. But um, whenever there was an opportunity to um, say this, but I always realized I had the smallest role. So it was like, who am I to complain about this? You were the alchemistic blue. Yeah. But um, but it was interesting to get into the role. So all right. So I come from I don't come. I come from the Bronx, but I live in California, <laughs> where I know everyone's po politics are the same as mine, and it's very safe. I'm in Montana, I don't know who you are. So I never like to say this, but it was very interesting to be the uh, token Jew. And, um, and that's how I entered the role. And I don't know if it came across, because as I kept doing it, I did my Yenta uh, accent a little bit less and less. But, um, but I had to find a way into the role. And first I thought, well, maybe if I bought the right dress. And this I bought the last minute, so it wasn't that. <laughs> um, thank God J. Jill was there with one piece of clothing that fit me. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I needed a way to enter the role because I did not like how it was played in the previous, I, I shouldn't say that out loud to everyone, to whoever's recording this, but it seemed like a very dull role uh, from, from the woman who played it before. And, 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 and I experimented with all of a sudden with this Yiddish accent that came on really strong. It's like, no, he was not a Nazi, but you know, whatever. And, and, and I sort of did this spit up in my throat, you know, to try to get this Yenta thing out. And I practiced it and practiced it, and it was my only way into the role. And Tim would say, well, you don't have to do that for every role, and I wouldn't understand what does he, what does he mean. And then I tried to come a little different for when I spoke to, to um, Young as when I spoke to Beck, a little from different places in my throat, uh, in my gut. I, I think in the end, the real thing was to talk louder and I had to drop everything just to talk loud and I hope I was loud enough. But it was my way in and, and so it also brought me closer to my ancestors, my grandfather, my great-grandfather was a rabbi. I come from a whole line of rabbis. Um, John is not Jewish, but he wore a nice yarmulke. <laughs> we daven together, you know, so, so brought up some of my Jewish background. And I did not grow up religious, but we honored the, um, the holidays. And, and so, um, so it was very nice for me to tap in to that Jewish side. And, and so I enjoyed playing it. And I would start like doing my Yiddish role, you know, throughout the day. And, and John and I are, we're, most of you know, we're engaged. And, uh, and we would start like all, all of a sudden like being in conversation and, and a line from the play would come up and we would continue it. So it was delightful to be with someone with, well, we don't live together, but, but on and off. But, um, <laughs> well, we threatened to live together, but it hasn't happened yet. You know, when we came for practice, was it last night or yesterday? It was raining, and we were discussing this thing about the Yiddish accent, and a 
about Eichmann, the scene where Eichmann appears. And she's saying, I'm going to have frizzy hair. And I said, what better revenge could there be against Eichmann than to have frizzy hair and a Yiddish accent? <laughs> Hey, Patrick had a question. Yes. <laughs> well, I just want to say uh, hello, everyone. My name is Patrick, and I wanted to thank Susie. I was walking by, and she invited me to the play. And I've seen, uh, I've read, uh, I thought that the building was closed down. I didn't know that it was still active with performances, so I really appreciate being able to go. And as well as I value history and culture immensely, it's one of the things that I enjoy researching and knowing about, uh, not only my own as a Native American and uh, Pennsylvania Dutch and Irish, but, but other people's cultures. And I, I don't know a lot about this culture. And I, I, I also love philosophy, so I didn't know about anything about this philosopher. I never heard of him, actually. So from the experience, I, I, I got a lot of names, and I'm going to look up your YouTube channel. I'm going to re go through it, and there's a lot of um, different topics or bullet points that I want to go research and get a little bit more familiarized. That way, um, I, you know, I can speak on the Yiddish culture or the, or the background of uh, what happened. And I don't, other than Auschwitz, I don't know too much about what took place back in that, that wartime. So um, it enlightened me a little bit of a topic that I don't know a lot about and I want to research now and get to know. But I think you guys did a great job. It was, it was an excellent play. I was uh, you know, tuned in the whole time. So I just want to thank everybody for the invite. I mean, not to experience. It was just kind of a random thing. But uh, there's things I want to uh, do now. Thank you. We're your cousins because I'm a quarter Pennsylvania Dutch. <laughs> so that was worth our year of effort just to hear you say that. Can you tell us what you're uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Spokane tribe because my father is an enrolled member of the Karoo tribe from Humboldt County, Georgia, California, in the Sweet and Willoughby area. And my son, uh, my son and his mother is an enrolled black people. So um, in order for me to have a child who was enrolled in a tribe, uh, my blood quantum would have thinned out if I didn't have a child with another Native American. And my mother raised me, I was raised in San Diego, California, and she raised me as a Native American. And to always value that and know that, it was important. So when it came time for me to pick somebody to have my child with, I, I wanted to make sure I had somebody with as much blood quantum or more than I, so that way I could continue the lineage of the child being enrolled because I believe it's important to the Native American's future and keeping reservations and keeping our sovereign entity and, and our rights that we have. And, and, and not letting it um, get out to where that it can be taken away or we could lose it. So that was my motivation behind that. And that's actually why I'm up here to try to be with my son. The mother's kind of giving me a hard time, but uh, you know, I'm working on it, so. Well, I, I just want to thank you for, for being here because we've been trying to reach out, uh, especially to Native Americans, because this is, this is the Native American land that we stole. And so thank you for being here. And you know, that's funny, uh, when, I, when I came into the play, I was, uh, greeted by my Sweat Lodge leader, one of them, um, Daniel, who was sitting in front of me, and he runs Sweat Lodges on Wednesdays, and, and I, was, I was surprised to see a familiar Everybody face. Everybody Sweat Lodges? <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, he, he, he said, hey, what are you doing here? I, I, you know, I got to be in contact with him, and um, Susie came and sat close to me and greeted me and, and welcomed me and stuff, so that felt very welcoming, and I appreciate it. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to respond. Sorry. Hearing off of No, no, no. Louder, please. I wanted to respond to what you said about your role being small because I felt as though you were the glue that made it work. In your yeah. beautiful yeah. feminine yeah. form, yeah. radiating empathy, and yeah. it was like in calligraphy we'd make that arc. <laughs> you, you depart, like you, you made the connections, and without your role, I think the the play would have been like. And wasn't Sherry great she was. when she <laughs> took on the roles of Ram and Eichmann? Ram was hanged as a worker, and obviously Eichmann was. And that, I thought not only that she did that, but in a very um, you know uh, tough subject of which you guys took on and was discussing, she brought a little bit of humor and, and lightness to it to where not only connecting all the dots or whatever, but it made it easy to listen to while there was tough uh, things being discussed and, and uh, debated or, or discussed. Mm -hmm. So that, that, was, that, was, that made it easy for me to smile while the toughness was being discussed. So I appreciated that as well. She was the glue. Yeah. Nice. Oh, and that last night dress, like it looked. What's that? It's the yeah. last night dress. It looked. Yeah, right. And the shoes too. It's the only size they had left in the store. <laughs> 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 
I'm always into the last minute stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I mentioned to, to her earlier uh, that she had the kindest eyes. I don't know if you all noticed her eyes, yeah. 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 but these amazing yeah. eyes. Oh, thank you. And, and so at some point, she, just, she kind of became like this guardian angel between the two of them to yes. and bringing them together. Uh -huh. you know? It was like, yes, it was like, and, and so your, your affect, which, which I trust is probably pretty sincere affect, um, it didn't look like acting. You know? uh -huh. I thought this eyes, I thought this, yeah, I think it just that really was the empowerment of her bringing it together was just, mm, you know, what you, you were. What and you that's the essence us. of what we need in our country because mm -hmm. it's, it's the women who have always held the civilization together, Turn honestly. Up. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you looked at Germany after World War One. It was only possible for a generation to come along to fight World War II because of the women of Germany. Okay, and that's not a critical comment. That's a, it's a fact that they held Germany together after the country was destroyed the first time. And they held it together again after it was destroyed the second time. But the essence of it all is that it does indeed take a village. It takes a village for us to be yes. commenting here tonight and yes. to say they did this and they did this and they did this. It's like yeah. it's true. And as a woman, I appreciate the honor and the, and the dignity you give to that. But I think the bottom line is that, you know, and that's, you know, one of the things is that we need to appreciate what we can accomplish together. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I used to belong to a four-part harmony chorus. And, and in, within that chorus, I get, I get angry at other people. And I think, oh, if they were out of the chorus, it'd be better. If they went out of the chorus, it'd be better. And finally, sometimes, I, one time I woke up, I realized that like, you could be on the risers alone. But being on the risers alone, singing four-part harmony is very difficult. I may or may not be capable of it, because I do have multiple personalities. But, but I thought, this is very difficult. And I think that whole that, the gestalt of all of us together is what is, is what creates the beauty of us. Yeah, and I want to speak up to that also. Um, us as a team has been amazing to work with. I'm a self-employed artist. I stay at home, especially during COVID. I mean, really kind of got into myself and and to be forced into this collaboration um, has just been remarkable. And we worked so well together. I mean, even in the play practice, um, whoever, commented about something else. I mean, especially when Tim wasn't there and we <laughs> criticized each other. Um, we all took on what they said. No one ever disagreed. Everyone was respectful. And it was an amazing piece. And then we first met in, in Aptos in, in November and at Colleen's house. And we had been working together by Zoom or whatever. And then we hadn't met. And Bob was there and all six of us were there. And it was like, and, and uh, Wally, we met him for the first time, and it was this family. It was like we came together as family, and we had never met, and it was it was stunning. We knew something. We knew we were going to do something. Yeah. We knew we were going to do something. Yeah. And there were some really difficult hours, I think. <laughs> yeah. We did not know what we were going to do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it kept like, changing. I, I want to hear from Wally, and I want to hear from Just get clear about this or that, you know, maybe. Um, and anyway, here we are. And all, the, happening. And, and all the details of putting together this confluence, and then Susie entered into it. Susie yeah, and Ray, yeah, that was a godsend, yeah. I swear. I mean, especially for Tim. A lot of responsibility rested on Tim because it's here in Helena and it's in, at his place. Um, but. But just the, the working together, and I, I'm an uh, artist, but I'm also a graphic artist, so I picked up all the graphic, you know, as much as I could. And, and everyone pitched in to their ability, and it was amazing. I'd like to say something to those of you who are over 89 years of age, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, new things keep happening. New things keep happening. <laughs> Wally is uh, Colleen's son, and we said early on that we wanted 
a videographer to uh, make a documentary about our confluence, the creators are. And um, Colleen said, well, my son is a, is a videographer, and why don't we use him? And I can't tell you how wonderfully Wally has fit into our group, and so I'd just like to hear something about it. Well, it's been a real honor to have the six of you to get to know, or I guess the five, I already know them. <laughs> <laughs> or at least I think I know. <laughs> um, and I, I really, as the videographer, I have nothing to add except for what a, what a powerful uh, performance it was this evening. How uh, I thought that the play on DVD was interesting, maybe a little meh. And um, and then the first run through that I filmed in complete <laughs> hour after hour working through it all it was like okay we'll see if anything happens. From there. <laughs> so I have all this footage that uh, is, is going to be what where uh, we came from. Yeah. But uh, this evening uh, was very much an encounter that. Uh, spoke to me. I, I just really uh, uh, honor to play more uh, this time around with their performance and was just really moved by your performances. And you know, while in your presence, it was, it was very quiet, yeah. but very balanced and very sincere. And I think Presented with a, with a pile of rough notes from a union analyst in the Netherlands who happens to also be a cellist. And two months ago, both Tim and I were pretty worried about whether we could turn the cello performance into what a was intended to be. And Carson did a magnificent mm -hmm. job of totally putting it together. We, we handed him a pile of notes and <laughs> he created it. So Carson, please. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, Carson is the first cellist of the Helena Symphony. So. No, I, I'm just a section member. But, uh, okay. In fact, I believe so. I. I remember being contacted by Tim months and months ago, it might have been November, October even, mm -hmm. um, just saying, hey, I got your your contact information from, from Linda Kuhn, who is the section leader at the Helm Symphony. And uh, she said, you might be perfect for this, and he kind of explained the, the play and the, the role of the music in it, and I was like, yeah, that sounds fantastic. I love being part of things like that. and. The subject material of the play, especially, um, I, I am Jewish as well, a convert though, so oh, okay. don't, I don't have that <laughs> history to my my uh, experience, but uh, it, it definitely touched something deep with me too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, like Skip mentioned, um, putting the, the selections together was a little bit of an experience because Barbara Miller was the cellist who played with the original production and put the, uh, chose the selections. And they come from a really wide range of, of sources. There's a Vivaldi sonata, um, a Bach excerpt from his St. Matthew Passion, and uh, even a Beethoven um, quartet. And then a couple selections that were just 
themes transcribed from an opera that was apparently written in Theresienstadt. Um, I, I wish I knew more about this opera. It's, it's described as in the notes as um, uh, the Kaiser from Atlantis, and it sounds quite fantastical. I have no idea what the subject material is, but um, at first, uh, you know, trying to pull all these together, and the, the notes that I had were a little bit thin. There was, you know, a, a, a grainy photograph of her handwritten part that she had played off of, and I had to go do some investigating online to find these excerpts and get a better copy so I could read them and play them. Um, at first I was kind of like, no, they're, they're kind of diverse. They, they're not being really played in the style that would be chronistically correct for Bach or for Vivaldi. Um, but as I continued to work on this project and pull these together, it really took on a life of its own and I, I came to understand why she selected some of these very diverse um, excerpts. I think perhaps my favorite is the excerpt from the Bach, St. Matthew Passion. It's my, my cue notes are um, uh, Beck is saying, revenge is reserved for God. And it comes into this beautiful, plaintive passage from, from St. Matthew, as is Bach, is the name of the aria. Rusty, but I believe that means it is finished. Uh, yeah. Yeah, very appropriate, and it, um, especially tonight, is, uh, I think you. the Thank actors were so much. fire. I've only seen two of the other rehearsals, one on Zoom, and then right. yesterday wow. during technical rehearsal, of course, yeah. it's a lot of start and stop and, and stuff, but um, it really came into a life of its own, and it was something very special. Thank you. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, one more, then I have to recognize my wife who's asking a question Sorry. here. And finally, I want to give no, Tim the last word since it says so. We're overwhelmed here. So, yes, ma'am. Okay, what, what I really felt like writing away was that you could really feel that you became unbeknownst to each other, each other's analyst. And there was transference that took place, and um, the anima felt like, you know, kind of came in and I guess in strength of voice, I would start soft, which it seemed like, and then grow because men don't want to pay attention to their anima sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, the balance, it, it was there. And, and through that transference and through that understanding, taking, owning your own dark side, you both grew and you both became fast friends because you understood not only yourselves and each other, but you understood some universal aspects of life. Well, John knows that I consider him my rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie, you've been trying to get a question in, so... <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the Reconciliation Commission, because that concept is so critical for our time. Mm -hmm. the South, what they did in South Africa is really a remarkable thing, mm -hmm. where there's been this yeah. horrible bloodshed on both sides of the aisle. And, uh, you know, Tutu, who is... A, a friend, actually, of our, of my political satire group, the Montana Lago Valley Company. We spent some time with him and yeah. his family down in South Africa and talked about this stuff. Um, you know, how do you, when a, when something, something like Rwanda happens, mm -hmm. or South Africa, where there's so much violence, there's no way to deal with it. What's the next thing you do? And what Tutu says is, you allow everybody to tell their story. And one thing that happens in the play is, each of these guys, one at a time, they lean forward and they say, okay, I'm listening. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it seems to me, the point where the transformation happens. So in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, all they had to do was, was to tell their story. And the deal was, if you didn't know, don't know how it works, the perpetrators on both sides 
and the victims on, on both sides. And almost all the victims were the blacks, and almost all the perpetrators were the whites. Right. And the Truth and Reconciliation called everybody together and said, if you come and tell your story, you will not be prosecuted. In other words, if you present yourself as a human being, we, the committee, will sit and listen to you. We will say, okay, I will hear you as an analyst, which means I'm not going to judge you, even though you took the guy's fucking head off and you are guilty. I'm not going to say anything about your worthiness. I'm going to listen to your story. And each, everybody listens to the story. And one of the things that just I found unbelievable was this guy who lost his son, a black guy who lost his son to the you know, Stasi police in a park in South Africa and was crippled himself. And then everybody listened to his story. And of course, Tutu just keeps dissolving with tears because how can you hear this stuff and not be incredibly moved? So then the committee asked each person, what can we do for you? And his answer was, he's in a wheelchair. He says, in my little tiny cardboard house, I would like to have a threshold that allows me to push my wheelchair into the house now. <laughs> That's what he wanted. It's something you can pick up, you know, at the hardware store for $3.95. Right. And that's what he wanted after all of that violence. And I think this is what we are all capable of. When, you know, something terrible happens to me, somebody splits my throat, and I just I want to do nothing but murder this person. And if I can tell my story and say, God, that was so painful. You know, I just felt so bereft. I felt so long. And all these people are listening to me. All of a sudden, there's a connection. And, and I realized, I don't want to kill the guy. All I want is the, the little threshold on my, on my doorway. Right. You, know. you want the killing to stop, too. Right. <laughs> what we really want underneath is we want, we want connection with the other person. Well. Can I say something? Yes, yes the please. Rabbi wants, he wants forgiveness. Because that was his philosophy is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Reconciliation is not the forgiveness. Yes. It's something that let's, let's talk. Okay, you forgive something. somebody for killing Forgiveness yourself. is something else. Mm -hmm. It's more deeper than that. It's that you go free. Which is the Rabbi would like to that cannot be. Because I was going to bring the South Africa to see them to it's not the same scale, of course. Second World War was something else. But it's similar, but the same thing. How the humanity is dealing with their own action. Because that's what we do. It didn't come from the sky. It's not the mushroom. It's not somebody coming from the ground. We did it. And how can we deal with it? When it ends, we find with the dilemma. Can we reconciliate at the same time for him? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to do. I don't even know if it's necessary. I think the understanding, the hearing the other, and understanding. And this one thing, we all become wiser, which is philosophy. It's impossible. So we have some class who are ready to go past the door and say, okay, I'll forgive you. I think what happened in the Holocaust, a, a, a lot of the, 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 the talk is, I'll forgive but not forget. And I think mm -hmm. the Jews that did move along found some way, and reconciliation was not even part of that thing. I, I could forgive but not forget. And so Which the message of the Holocaust is to never forget. They're still in. When you know, you cannot forget something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It makes you really have to forget. Well, I don't know how they do it. Because we have yeah. ego. 
you have something inside. Yeah. Well, it's, it's mixed with the pride also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what do you do with that? We are born with it. Mm -hmm. And when that stands up, it makes it very difficult to forget. Mm -hmm. It's the beginning of oneself. But for what one did. I think it's what if we do a reconciliation between the parents, who's the, the 19 pairs of parents whose children were murdered? and the 19 officers that stood outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. what, what, what might a reconciliation be like there? I mean, it's at that level. Kindness and compassion. Yes. Yeah. And, and how can you forgive? I don't think of forgiving. You can't forgive somebody for murdering your child, but you can understand. You can have understanding. I give you an example. I grew up in the world. Where? I had a bunch of my family killed in the war by the French. It was a war. In the war, we could get killed the whole The independence came, and I went to student in France because I was going to speak. When I was born, I was born in French, were there. No, my mother. Origin of language I would call French, it's maternal language, French. So I went to France to study. Here I am in the University of French people. And I have 49 people killed from my own family by these people. I have to deal with it. Do I hate all these people? Why I'm here? I should leave. And I got to learn. Yes, there are some bad people in this, but there are some good people in this. Too. Maybe the people who are with me in the same country that I take over in the class are good people, and I should love them. I learned to live with them. So I don't hate the French. Yeah. I don't hate them, even though they came 49 from my own family. And it was very hard. You know, step down. But you got to know it. And that's what humanity is. You just have to ask the same question of reconciliation and forgiveness. And you got to live with it too. Yes. Uh, Jessica, Jessica has a yes, So I just became aware of a group that is a group that is designed to listen to people who hear voices who are either schizophrenic other mental health, health issues to, to hear people that we quote unquote normal people don't hear. And the groups are run by people who are not therapists. They're people who experience the voices themselves. And they get together and they listen to one another and they are de-escalating the violence, the potential violence that is brewing from people will be stigmatized and isolated and drugged and mm -hmm. tortured basically and, and told that they're less than human and the fact that you know I have utmost respect for therapists it's not that I don't but there there is this element of if you have experienced it yourself you can listen with a, a level of empathy that is different and the, if, if, if that is possible, if it is possible for, for people to come together and, and resonate and empathize and listen, on that level of, okay, I'll, I'll use the word distortion, but maybe that's a judgment word. I don't mean it that way, but there is a, a distortion of thinking about I say this from first-hand experience, being mother of a son who is schizophrenic. And if, if that level of de-escalation of violence is possible by listening and making people feel seen and heard, it's got to be possible all across the board, you know, whatever race, whatever age, whatever you are dealing with personally. 
weekend that we've been having since it started Friday, I've been fairly quiet and uh, haven't really participated in a lot of the uh, expressive activities. And my experience of it has been, I knew this going in, I knew it about play a month ago, um, that the big part for me was simply going to be listening to Anima. And I had a very big dream about three and a half years ago uh, that was exquisitely anima. And uh, I haven't had a, any anima dreams since then. So I, I think it's calling me to, to come to resolution with that dream. So in the course of this, that, that has been a, a really big part of this. And as I experienced the play tonight, I found myself sort of running aground occasionally with it because this is a conversation that happened between two people who weren't activated currently, like our culture is. Um, they both had a conscience. Mm -hmm. You may not be able to find that a lot in our culture anymore, mm -hmm. on, particularly on one side, but I would say it, it goes around. So when we talk about reconciliation or forgiveness, I don't think the storm has come yet for that reconciliation. I think we're, I, I could be wrong. I want to believe I'm wrong. I think we're going to be walking into the belly of the beast. And that, that hasn't come yet. So when we talk about reconciliation right now, I think that is a great thing to stick in the back of our mind because I think ultimately that is what we're working toward. But in a, in a, in a big way, the storm hasn't even hit yet. Mm -hmm. And this conversation happened after the war was over, after there was a possibility of reconciliation, the storm had passed. So I think how we consider this and hold it in our minds um, and in our bodies for that matter, um, it's, it may be to understand that, to not be premature with this. That this is preparation for something else. That's maybe, hopefully, on the other side of that. But that isn't, I don't think, what's at hand. Thank you, Ray. I, I just want to add to this, that when evil is unleashed, Dr. Young knew this, and he recognized what was happening in Germany as a psychic epidemic. And the problem that they faced is they couldn't stop it until all the crockery was broken. Everything had to be broken, and then they could recover. And so if we don't stop the evil that's coming at us now, then we're not going to be able to stop it for at least a quarter of a century. That's what it took in Germany. And when it stopped, all the property will be broken. And so we all have to be very conscious of this. And everything we do in our lives has to be fighting against this evil. 
because if the evil gets control, it's going to eat us up and all the property will be broken. And I don't know what the result will be, but I know that it's going to be much worse than we think it's going to be. And how are you defining this evil? I'm not going to define it. Everybody should How can define. we fight it and, and not know what Everybody it is? Everybody has you to know define it, it for here. themselves. Well, sure. Okay. Dr. Young was emphatic about one verse of the Bible, which was the first epistle of John, 1 John 4 1. And that verse says, Consider the spirits, whether they be of God or not. Hmm. And the point is that we have to have enough maturity to decide, each one of us, what is good and what is bad for our society. And, and have enough Well, as long as you take into account the same. to make a difference. Good. I have a question of you, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you're a local professional. Um, and, and I would say, so I, 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 you know, I said as you walk back, unfortunately I agree with you, and I think you're going to be dead on. But do you have any advice for us as how we continue to tread water and move forward during this period of abyss and, and, and misery? Well, I, I, I think I can say how I am with it, which is um, to not panic, mm -hmm. to not be active to be reflective, to be able to move from compassion with strength. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think, how I will, or how I am. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not sure that I can say for everyone. I'm, I'm really taking up, what am I going to do in the next three years? Mm -hmm. um, and with, don't trade water. That's right. And Leah. I appreciate the comments about the bigger storm coming, but I also want to acknowledge the level that Jessica was talking about. That we can do. And what Colleen was talking about, the 19 policemen and the 19 families with dead children, that's something we can do. And it may be practice for something bigger, but we have to, we can do that. Absolutely. People are doing that. Right. Yes. Those 19 um, police officers were waiting mm -hmm. for somebody to tell them what to do. Sorry. Oh my God, that's what's happening, mm -hmm. is that we're losing our personal sense of agency mm -hmm. and that we have to prepare ourselves, as you say. This is a period of time to prepare ourselves, and it doesn't need to go out and buy a gun. It means to develop yourself as an individual that can act when I need to act, and, and with an understanding that, yes, this was coming. Yes, this was coming. No, here, and we can't a... say we didn't know. We can't say we didn't know. And I know from my profession, as a mental health professional, that a lot of my ability from acting situations that are high stress and crisis situations because that's what I do for a living is I handle crisis situations. It's, I'm really good at my job because of a lot of trauma that I've experienced in my personal life. Um, I'm able to enter into crisis situations because I know what to look for and it's a trauma response unfortunately mm -hmm. that I've learned how to navigate those situations based on my own trauma and that's what makes me very good at my job. <laughs> Um, right, right, and you know, my job as my, my profession is I'm literally licensed to have a medical mental illness. I couldn't have my license if I didn't have a mental illness. That's good. Um, I'm a licensed peer support specialist at work, and I have to have a medical mental illness to have my license. So that's what makes me good at my job. That's the, the beauty of it. Yeah, we need more of you. Yeah. Well, here, here's a segue of sorts to ponder. Um, a wise person or two summed up the essence of religion. 
in these very memorable words. But cease to do evil, learn to do good, purify that heart. Good. Two people said that. Say it again. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, purify thy heart. Isaiah said that, the Buddha said that. Different languages, exactly the same translation, same message. Isaiah predates the Buddha. But streams flow together. They come flew. Well, to further what uh, Sam has said, uh, Dr. Young had a very strong position, which was only the wounded doctor can heal. Only the wounded doctor can heal. And this is the essence of what Sam says is in her licensure. So let's all have mental health problems. And <laughs> 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 Say that. I'm just wondering what you think. Um, thanks. <laughs> Spotlight there, real quick. Um, I'm Pat. I I work in Ed's building. I'm a psychologist in in private practice here in town. Um, I really appreciate the Tutu references. That has been coming up. Um, Desmond Tutu's book on forgiveness has been something like a, a book that I've probably within the last five years has been one of the more influential ones to me. Um, and the, his process through the truth and reconciliation trials. Um, of, and I can't remember all the four steps, but you know, like telling your story, naming the hurt, um, being the first two, um, really powerful in, in this process. Like this, this is what I saw kind of like play out, you know, it, it, it might've looked like that, but if you, if you kind of like zoomed in like that, it was, it was a lot more like you know, like like this, there were, there was a lot more spikes in there. Um, I guess the one of the things that that um, kind of referring back to Tutu's and actually his daughter's, I think it was a quote from his daughter in that book, um, was that forgiveness is a is a gift that we end up giving to ourselves, that it is not this. This, you know, like we it, we don't hold it over somebody else. We don't lord it over somebody else. Um, but it is actually something that we we end up giving to ourselves. And I think that that that's a that's a, a just a turn of that crystal right there. That you get this totally different reflection once you once you make that transformation of what what forgiveness can be, and maybe what reconciliation can be. Dr. Jung greeted every new client with these words. So you're in the soup too. Yeah. The gray We're all in the soup. There's a lot of crockery back there, and I just want to honor everybody for leaving this place intact. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. Oh, okay. Well, just because I love Jim, that's why. Right. Well, I, I particularly wanted to, this is Brian Massman. I've known him for at least 30 years. I wrote a, co-wrote a musical that Brian was one of the lead characters in. And I just absolutely fell in love with this guy. First of all, you got to listen to his beautiful voice. I'm not honest. Yeah, he's got this really rich, beautiful voice. And in the early part of putting this play together, I thought, this is never going to work. I mean, we're working with people who are not, not only not actors, but not used to the theater. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the early rehearsals were so dismal, I thought, let's just throw it out <laughs> and get some professional actors. Oh, right there. Uh, yeah. Of which we know many. We said yes. We said yes. Please, please, please. <laughs> And Brian was the guy I had picked for Jung. Ah. Um, not only because of his mustache, but, but because of this. That can go any day. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just a fabulous actor. And, um, and I've always wanted to do a project with him ever since 1985. Right. I mean, this right. Right. 
but I, I wanted to introduce him to you three because oh. because it's almost in it. Yeah. yeah. After we decided that you were maybe going to be able to pull it off, <laughs> I hired you to do the video, and I gave him the whole you know the, which uh, I did professionally for many many years. Yes, and so because of technical problems, he couldn't he couldn't carry it off, but. But what I did was try to replicate what Brian did. Oh, he did a fine job. He did. He yeah. did. When I watched it, it's like, yeah, I guess we had a good discussion because uh, that looks exactly like what I would, except it looked like more than I thought. <laughs> and, and, and we tried to try to But I would have been more hesitant. Probably there would have been less because I would have been like, well, I don't want to step on Tim's toes, but they're your own toes, so you can step all over them. By the, by so the they probably would have been a little less of it, but um, it was exactly what I was going to do was that none of the, pl with, none of the uh, players, layers. None of the players saw the video before right. yeah. yesterday. Oh, I and see. yesterday, when we were doing the dress rehearsal, um, we saw some flickering behind oh, us. Oh, that! that was so but we never, never yeah. we never saw <laughs> what was actually being yeah, projected so behind us. And so I, I looked at the dress rehearsal last night and I, I, I saw what Tim had done. And it was really genius. Uh, really genius. I've seen a lot of Tim's video work too, and so I knew that he was more up to date with his. Uh, Equipment than me, and uh, it, was, it was probably he just wanted to include me and he wanted to lighten his own load. But I knew he could do it. Yeah, just have me sit down. I have an uh, issue on stage. Is that I'm bigger than everyone else. <laughs> God bless us every heart. <laughs> so whenever I've been in a play, I've waited to see how long it takes for the director to make me sit down. And usually that's about five minutes into the first rehearsal to figure out where to make this guy sit. Because uh, I just stick out. I saw you in the audience. You were one of the only people in the I sit in the front because my feet are huge. It's a size 15 to everyone. In case you were curious. I have a question about the play. So the difference between you guys talking about the uh, plays you saw it originally, and then the uh, energy to this one, which, I mean, you'd never know you guys hadn't done this before. It's fabulous. Was the video something that was in the first one, or is that something that, Tim, you added? Because that certainly added energy to the play. Was that... In the original one, did they have video yeah, behind yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, because that was... It's, it's, yeah, it worked really well, I thought, to do exactly what you had in mind, and you had, you had it down, that it, uh, you know, it's... We all know those images. I mean, everyone that would go to a play like this, we've all seen those images before, once exactly like them, but it just adds depth and uh, pacing to a play that needs, you know, chapters yeah, and pages crazy. turning and things like that. Oh, and it's yeah. just one more thing that that just adds, you know, variety and depth and, and you did it exactly right the, mm -hmm. the way that it should be. And that it doesn't, it did enough stage because it, because uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it helps. Because mm -hmm. you need a little love staging sometimes, it gets too much the same, mm -hmm. especially yeah, yeah, with uh, uh, drama and uh, one acts, you know, where you're going to go a little bit longer sometimes with the audience not, you know, getting out of their seats. Both of those things are are uh, a challenge. I've seen way too many shows that go on for an hour and fifteen, and. It's intense the whole time, but it's like after about 45 minutes, you're like, something different. Everybody yeah. just did that really, really well, and so did, of course, you, with even better, this yeah. was the best yeah. one, that really, you know, chapter. Yeah.
put it in some of the the script. Because nothing was mentioned about. First of all, I'd like to say that I think the, work, the reason it worked is because you both told your stories where you were in the gray area and you both faced that and it's a dilemma. And we all face that at times in our lives. Which way do I go? You know, neither one is a good choice. But I would also like to ask, I'm curious as to why Mary Stein wouldn't have added or into the script that Jung was also trying to protect people like Neumann, wasn't he? That's what I read. That well, well, yes, he, he did. He did. Okay. And it's, I, only, it's only me that very fastly put that concept out. Okay, when I say Neumann said God is dead, Jung proved Nietzsche. Jewish. Are you? I'm sorry, you're talking Jewish, about Jewish um, Neumann. Neumann. Right, right. So Neumann was um, Jung's best student, and when World War II began. Um, Neumann went to Israel, and um, they didn't hear from one another for uh, five years, at least five years, maybe six. And in that period, uh, Neumann wrote uh, The Origins of Consciousness, The Origins of the History of Consciousness, which is a profound book, absolutely. It's a great book. I know, but I'm asking, I've read that you almost, some people might say, I don't know if this is accurate or not, the reason he stayed in his position was to protect some of the uh, Jewish analysts that were practicing in Germany. And he left that completely out of the story. Well, I mean, it's assuredly true that many of the people that were close to you were Jews. Okay, including all the women that started the Young Institute in Zurich in 1948. And um, the, the woman who edited Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which is what passes for Young's memoir, it's actually a memoir of his psychological development. But the woman who did that was Aniela Yaffe, who was a Jew. Her son uh, was Lawrence Jaffe. He was a Jungian analyst in Berkeley. Unfortunately, he died young. But he wrote a book, a wonderful book, called Liberating the Heart. And in that book, he said on page 41, the most profound sentence I've found, which is, the essence of Jungian psychology is to bring us closer to the healing power of the unconscious. And I passed a copy of that to everyone, and Sherry did it in calligraphy and framed it, but we wanted to share that with everyone at the confluence because my insight is that that sentence applies also to every religion and it applies to every art. That every religion brings us closer to the healing power of the unconscious. Well, I'll just speak up on that point as a physician. Um, You're the professional. And as a psychiatrist. <laughs> and I used to sit with my fellow psychiatry students and I'd say, you know, just the same way that the body heals, you cut the body, you injure the body, whatever, the body heals, it's a natural process. I said the same thing is true of the psyche. If you just get out of the way and let it happen. And my fellow residents was like, what are you talking about? You know, this, this is mental illness. No, the same thing is true, and that's exactly what Jung, well, what Jaffe was pointing out here, is that there is a power 
just like in the body, it's in the psyche because it's all one thing. Mm. If you get out of the way, it will heal you. It will heal you. Okay. And I believe that very strongly. Yeah. 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 Thank you. so much. I feel like this is such a rich conversation. I go to the point in the morning. We've got to start again.